You're listening to a Bookanista podcast. Hi there and welcome to this Bookanista podcast. I'm Catherine Nathan and today I'm talking to first-time novelist Nima Shah about her brand new book, Kololo Hill, published by Picador in the UK and released here in mid-February. Hey Nima, it's good to have you with us. So, tell us, what's it been like trying to prepare for your book launch in lockdown? What have you been up to? Um, it's been very interesting. I mean, I think the whole sort of journey's been a bit strange anyway because I, I came to writing late. Um, so it's been interesting sort of just learning the publishing industry as a whole and it, and it moves fairly slowly compared to many other industries because I signed my Picador contract two years ago and 2021 felt like a very long time um, from then. Um, but obviously as with everything, things just sort of sped up as I went along the process. Um, And before COVID hit, I was just working with my editor to get the book ready. And then obviously COVID hit. And it was very interesting seeing how 2020 debut authors were managing, because I think they adapted really well, but they've had to obviously contend with bookshops not being open Um, A lot more purchases online, actually, which is great. Um, People not being able to have book launches, which as a debut author is really nice to be able to do that in person and meet readers. Um, But, you know, you just have to sort of adapt, as we've all had to adapt for various reasons um, and in different ways. And actually, in other ways, I think it's going to open open up opportunities. So, obviously, with more online events, um, it makes book events more accessible and you can reach wider audiences, you can reach global audiences in a way that would have been much more challenging, costly and time um, cost as well, I suppose. Um, So although there are downsides and it is difficult to promote a book in this sort of situation, um, there are other things that have been better in in many ways and I hope that we continue I mean accessibility is definitely important whatever happens. Do you um do you somehow feel that your poor mum and dad have been robbed of the opportunity to come and see you in a bookshop in person? Yeah I guess so I think I was you know when I signed that contract two years ago that was one of the things I was thinking oh it's going to be so nice to go along with my parents with my friends um and go into a bookshop and pick up my book But to be honest, the dream of just having a book published um, and being able to hold it in my hands, I haven't actually got a final copy yet, but I will do soon, is is lovely. And being able to show that to my parents will be amazing. Um, And, you know, publishing and being an author, hopefully, are a long-term thing for me. And later in this year, I hope to be able to go into a bookshop and actually see see the book on a bookshelf. But... It's just one of those things that's a bit delayed. Um, I'm not seeing it as it's never going to happen. Um, it's uh, Yeah, and there's way worse things that could be going on, so I'm, I'm grateful just to be published. Um, and when it comes to um, thinking about being an author for the first time and, um, you know, it's a massive achievement, obviously, whatever happens that you've written, you've successfully written a book, someone's paid you to write a book, and it's going to be in a bookshop, it's been published. It's an incredible achievement. Um, And so many people, you know, throughout their lives go, oh, I've got a book in me, I've got a book in me. At what point in your life did you realise that you had a book, and if not, more than one in you? Quite recently. I mean, I think in my, in my sort of early sort of 30s, I was thinking, Oh, it's it's really strange how there's no books about um, East African Asians, which is obviously my heritage. Um, but I didn't think I had the skills uh, to write. You know, I loved English at school, but like quite a lot of authors, actually, some people who, who have come to writing late, I think there was that idea that I didn't know any authors. I didn't know any writers even, actually, um, really, not not in terms of fiction writers who write and publish books. Um, And so it just didn't feel like something that I could do. And then it was only because I did a short course in creative writing, partly just to help me with my day job in marketing. I wanted to be a better copywriter. Um, And I did that and actually realised, okay, I'm not I'm not as bad as I thought. And also you just get this real thrill when you write something or I do do anyway. It's just, you know, sorry, it sounds a bit cheesy, but you feel more alive um, when you're doing something you're passionate about and 
and I'd forgotten that side of me completely. You know, obviously you get into a career and then you don't really think about what were your dreams when you were younger. Um, And so it came about that I just sort of developed it and I thought, you know, that story that I thought about writing and and what I'd want to read, maybe I should have a go at writing it. So so that's how it came about. And that was only sort of five years ago, you know. So in 2015, I started the creative writing course and and here I am. And, and, you know, in subsequent books, I want to explore British Asian history. Um, and I think there are obviously now more British Asian authors, but not that many that focus on his, history. And I feel like we've got a lot of catching up to do almost in that we've got lots of contemporary writing. Um, but what happened, you know, when there were, there were Asians in this country uh, for, there've been Asians in this country for centuries, but not many people actually know that. And so I think it's just really important to tell those stories and hear their voices um, in a way that hasn't necessarily happened so far. That's great. So this is a perfect opportunity. So Nima has written a book called Kololo Hill, and it's based on an an Indian experience, if you like, people coming from Uganda and what it was like being Asian or being Indian in Uganda in the 60s and 70s. So I'm going to let Nima tell us a bit about some context of what this book's about. Yeah, so it's set in uh, Uganda in 1972, or at least that's where it starts. And it's about recently married Asha and her husband Pran, who were given 90 days to leave by President Idi Amin. And they're forced to leave everything behind except their devastating secrets, um, because, of course, they would be. Um, but yes, I mean, I think there's there's two stories. There's obviously their family story. And I wanted to make sure it is a very personal story of what are the personal experiences of those sorts of people that had to leave and were given 90 days. They were also only given like, £50 pounds per each or whatever the equivalent would be today. And they had to leave their businesses. They had to leave their homes. And... I just thought about that quite a lot and you know growing up as a British Asian you do you do think about that you know most most people of colour in the UK will have at some point or another been told to go back to their own country and in my case um, my grandparents came went to East Africa in World War Two actually and they and then my parents were born in East Africa in Tanzania and Kenya and I've got extended family who are from Uganda as well so It was quite interesting because it's not as though my direct relationship is to India, it's to East Africa, and that's where I consider my second home. And, you know, there is a very unique culture and a unique... um, There's even a unique language, I would say. Certain Swahili words have sort of been infused into our Gujarati and our Hindi. So so that's the the thing that I wanted to explore in this book um, and and to look at how this family cope, and some, some family members cope better than others, So it follows their journey from Uganda to Britain as British passport holders, which is another thing that's perhaps not that well known. Um, And I think when I wrote this and when I started talking about it to people, it was quite interesting. There's a bit of a generational divide in that older people will, will actually remember it from the news reports in the UK, whereas there's certain people probably under the age of 25, 30 who would who just have no idea that this even happened maybe in 40s actually and it surprised me because it's a core part of British history and 80,000 Ugandan Asians were expelled and scattered across the world many of whom came to uh, the UK uh, as British passport holders. And when it comes to thinking about you know what that means so there's there was an awful lot in terms of the themes of the book there was an awful lot obviously about identity it's about belonging um it's about what you know and it's also about just being stripped bare in terms of having nothing and so when you mentioned they were all told that they had 50 pounds well it's it's a 50 pound allowance isn't it um that we're talking about so they were only ever ever allowed to leave the country with 50 pounds worth of cash yeah now when you've run your own business or you know you live in quite nice homes and all of that you know they really had nothing when they left that's right yeah and your parents and your family will often I'm sure have have spoken to you about how they used to live elsewhere and somehow you know there's a scaling down of means or a scaling down of your life when you come to live in um in the UK so is that something that infused um how you thought about bringing this family to life 
Yeah, definitely. Because as you say, I mean, this family are probably that you probably class them as middle class in Uganda. They're, you know, as you say, they're business owners, and they become effectively working class because. Um, I mean, I don't know, none of them actually have university educations, but but even then, they're still skilled workers, but they have to start from scratch, and, you know, they, they end up as factory workers and so on. And it was the same for Ugandan Asians who did come to this country. Some were more skilled than that. They were u- university PhD educated in some cases, but had to start again. And that's another thing that was quite interesting for me to explore was, you know, we talk a lot about class in Britain, but class becomes quite nebulous for immigrants because you are often changing class from one country to another. So I wanted to look at that and how they start again and what it takes to start again from scratch as refugees, essentially. And I suppose even that word refugee, I think there is, it's quite a loaded word, obviously, and people envisage, in many cases, refugees being people who come from war-torn countries where they probably maybe didn't have that much even to start with in the country that they're coming from. Whereas in this case, everything was sort of pulled away from them and they had to start again under those circumstances. So, yeah, I wanted to explore that. And I look at that through the gaze of three key characters. So Asha, who's younger, the recently married woman. Vijay, her brother-in-law, who's who's younger and he actually has a disability as well. And then Jaya, the mother-in-law, and and look at the generations and how they manage things. But it also explores the wider relationships of uh, various family members as well and how they, they react. As I said, some better than others, actually. One of the things, when you explore these um, themes and issues through the gaze of your um, three main characters. Was there a reason why you left Pran out of that? I was quite interested that we only ever heard from three of the the principal characters and you left Pran out. Was there a reason for that? Yes, so Pran um, is Asha's husband um, and he's a really complex character, actually. I think that partly I felt that he... His, his character can be explained quite well and shown quite well through other characters. And also, I actually didn't think he was the most interesting to explore as a point of view. Um, I thought it was interesting to be able to let the reader decide what his motives are and, and what kind of man he is. And I think it can be read in different ways. Um, but the characters that I chose were perhaps characters that you're not used to hearing from and seeing in, in literature. So certainly Asha, as a, a young Asian woman, is less likely to be shown in literature. And, and Jaya, in particular, who's in her her early 50s, um, definitely isn't someone that you, you see very much of in literature. So those two characters, it was really important to show. And then Vijay, because he's an outsider in a way, because he, you know, he has a disability um, and... I thought that that would be interesting to look at. And you still get a very good sense of Pran and his motivations and his point of view. Um, But I kind of liked the reader to make up their own mind in a way that you can't maybe do when you've got a point of view character. Yeah, so in terms of those three principal um, characters who we um, follow and follow their journey and how they cope with the changes not only with the trauma that they faced um, in the 90-day run-up to having to leave but also having to relocate and and make the best of of what they find and you're right there are very few novels um, British Asian novels for sure that really explore the mindset of a first-generation person um, like Jaya and with her, all the the kind of complexity that she holds, you know, as a matriarch, as someone who bring, is trying to bring together and hold together a family, someone who's trying to be positive, but also trying to retain some level of dignity and um, and pride um, from where from where she's come from. And then finding herself as a total fish out of water and not speaking the language and all those kinds of things. It's the upending nature of that is just a phenomenal thing that I don't know that I've really read that many things um, that capture that so well, if you see what I mean. 
Yeah, that's right. And she she is a really interesting character because, uh, like you say, she has she doesn't speak the language and she's upended. But that actually happens to her twice because she comes over to Uganda as a, a young bride um, in her teens and she doesn't speak Swahili and there's no family around her. She has to do all of those things the first time round and establish a home and create a family from that, away from her own family. And then, as you say, it happens again and she's she's forced, again, by, by circumstances outside her control because the first time, obviously, her husband says where she should go and the second time... It's the government saying, get out of the country, and she has to start again in her 50s. Um, and I'm absolutely right, and I'm so glad that you picked up on the dignity, I suppose, because one thing is that, yes, she's a very small sort of, you know, petite character but in, in terms of her frame and her body size, but I wanted her to be really strong and actually one of the strongest characters in the book because that's my impression of most Asian women, and I think that in my life and I think that sometimes there is this this stereotype of Asian women as, as as sort of submissive and quiet and so on especially of that generation and that's not been my experience at all um, and she is partly inspired by my own uh, grandmother um, but other other women as well in the same way that Asha is partly inspired by my mum and my aunt um, so yeah, it was really important for me to show that and how she is, how Jaya is the, the glue, really, that holds everything together to an extent. And I think to that point, it's very um, interesting how in that first generation experience when, when people have arrived here, it's a very different experience for men mm. than it is for women. And I think that was really, that's one of the points that came across um, very clearly in the book and is also true of, of I, I guess, my family experience. And mm. to your point, sadly, um, no, I can't even imagine my mum as being a petite, gentle Indian lady. No, certainly not. But she really is also the glue and the matriarch and they're very strong characters. And this isn't something we get to see very often, definitely not on TV and definitely not mm. in many novels. But what they do do is there's a, there's an adaptability there and yeah. a willingness to embrace a new opportunity in a way that I, I don't think I, I ever really understood until later on in life how yeah. extraordinary that is Absolutely. when a lot of the men are slightly stuck in a yeah. way of being that they had been conditioned into and found this whole new experience something that wasn't so easy to embrace. I think that's absolutely right. Yeah, I think there are, you know, obviously in Indian culture, there are quite clear roles that are defined for you um, as a man and as a woman. And and yeah, in my research, I, I found this really interesting because, it, again, this isn't something that you see a lot of. Um, but, but some of the Asian men, when they came over here, because their, their sort of role had been pulled apart and you know, everyone had to sort of survive and fight. Um, traditionally, the women would stop working once they got married, usually. And and in this situation, you know, the husbands probably couldn't make as much money as they normally would. And, and the women had to go out and work as well. And I think that that really caused, caused a crisis of identity for some men who came over here. And I think the ad adaptability bit point is really interesting as well, and I, I think that's absolutely true. And perhaps, I hadn't really thought about it consciously, but women in these sorts of circumstances are better equipped to adapt because they are brought up to know that they're going to have to have an arranged marriage and, and go and marry someone and learn a new life with another family, whatever happens. So perhaps the stretch of starting again in a new country or in, uh, elsewhere is, is is slightly easier for Indian people in that situation than uh, Indian women, sorry, rather than men. Um, certainly that is kind of what I'd look at. And I don't want to say all the women are like this and all the men are like this in the book or in, in real life, of course, but I suppose that there is that and you do see more adapt adaptability with the women than the men in most of the situations in the book, I think. And and the willingness um, to 
embrace um, the opportunity and kindness. And I thought there there was something quite telling in um, in the book that when we meet characters both in Uganda and in the UK along the way on their journey, which is a harrowing one, um, of you know, to say the least. But that um, every interaction or touch point that they had with someone that um, demonstrated any kindness towards them was really touching and really interesting because you realise, and, and, and I think a lot of people in, in host communities period, whether you're in a workplace and someone new is starting uh, you know, in your office or whatever it is, you quite often forget what it feels like to um, be an outsider and come into something and what power you hold as a host to make someone feel comfortable or just able to function. Yes. And there's a power in that that I think um, that you captured quite well with your very small moments of kindness that you, um, that you show us in the book. Yes, thank. I think that that definitely is true, and it was really important also to show all three of the key races, so Ugandans, Indians, and British people, in different lights, because that's that's the reality. You know, there was racism against the Ugandans, both by the British and the Indians. There was racism by the Ugandans against the Indians, which is obviously what partly led not not all of them, but President Idi Amin. Um, pushing the Indians out um and then again once I came to Britain yes there was some racism but there were also some extraordinary stories that I came across you know of of English families and British families taking Ugandan Asians into their homes these complete strangers so yeah I absolutely thought it was good to to show the humanity of of people um in the most difficult of some circumstances um And it is multifaceted, you know, the whole immigration process, the whole of the refugee crisis is very complex. And it's not as black and white as saying, you know, everyone who treats uh, refugees will be treating them badly or or whatever. It's it's the case that there are lots of different circumstances. And I've only shown one family, obviously, but I've tried to show different... um, different ways of behaving I suppose throughout the book. So one of the central themes in the book is around loyalty when it comes to you know this book and the characters and it's one of the things that really drives them especially Pran it's loyalty it's um, that sense of identity and belonging which is really complex and it's so interesting when someone has been rejected if you like by the place that they were born and the place that they come from this inextricable link that they have to that to that place and the notion of home and what it takes to redefine the boundaries of home if you've been rejected in a place so it's a really complex kind of theme is there what what was your kind of thinking behind having him really not be able to get over the fact that he has to leave his home yeah I mean I think it it is really complex and I'm not sure that any of the people that leave, especially Asha and Vijay, who were also born in Uganda, feel that Uganda is less their home than Pran. It's more a case of, they all accept, like, that, that is my home, that's what they're thinking, but I think they all react differently to, okay, that that is my home, but I have to make the best of what's happened to me. And I think they all have different ways of approaching that. And I, you know, I don't think it's a spoiler to say that Pran... Pran holds on to what Uganda means much more than the others. And, and also he holds on to, I think he associates his dreams with Uganda and, and can't accept that his dreams can, can be fulfilled in a new country. Um, and for all the reasons I was talking about earlier in terms of the, the difficulty of adapting for certain people, I think that it's partly that. He's also just very... I mean, it's quite stubborn, to be honest. And and I wanted to show the, the dangers of not adapting, I suppose, although they're completely under, understandable um, ways of feeling. You know, it's, it's very hard, unless you've been through that, to understand what it's like to have it pulled away. And I talk a bit about that as well, that actually we don't really think about the concept of home um, that much until it's threatened. 
And, you know, I wrote this this novel against the backdrop of the rise of Trump, Brexit, um, the Grenfell crisis, and then also um, the Windrush uh, scandal. So all of those things were sort of playing on my mind. And I guess I had been thinking a lot more about the concept of home, more so than I have for quite a long time, uh, in that I felt a lot more settled and I felt strongly that I was British, I was born here, so I consider myself British, but it made me question those thoughts and, and think about that a lot more, and I guess I'm, that was also something I was trying to explore with Pran and with the other characters. And that kind of sense of loyalty, I thought it was really interesting, and I know we had talked about Jaya and, and how she was able to adapt probably a bit, you know, quite surprisingly, um, a bit more easily than some of the other members of the family. And when it comes to that, um, there, there, I get the sense that both her leaving so early um, her home in India and then getting to Uganda and being in this kind of very um, new and foreign place and then getting to England and doing that all over again, it's like, well, where is her loyalty? Where does that, you know, where does that sit? And I thought it was really interesting because for someone like my mum, it's exactly the same as, as your parents. Well, while she was born in India, she left at the age of 17. So she's never really lived there for you know only a very short window of time. And they lived all around the world before they came here. Mm. So when to, to your point, when someone says go back to where you come from, well, for my mum, that could be one of several countries mm. before she ever arrived here. And that sense of belonging in England or in the UK for my mum is super, super um, strong because it's the one place she's found herself in in her life where she could feel like she um, she was not oppressed or she was not forced to live a life she didn't really want to or she could express herself or she she gained freedoms I guess um that she didn't think she would have yeah um in any of the previous existences or places that she was in is that something that you talked to your grandparents or your parents about before no and actually I, I I've learned more about their life um even though we, we did lots of, you know, we had lots of family holidays in Kenya and I, I even spent about a year as a toddler in Tanzania. But but um, it wasn't really until I started writing this that I talked about a lot of those things. But I absolutely agree that, you know, now I think my parents consider themselves British. Um, they've been here longer in, in England than they have been um in Kenya and Tanzania so and obviously you know their, their kids were born here so I think there's also that and and for Jaya that's the same with Uganda you know her kids were born in in Uganda so there's those connections that you make but I think that's another contrast between someone like Jaya and someone like Pran so Jaya is able to absorb all of the countries that she visits uh, so she lives in sorry and and they all become part of her and part of home whereas for other characters, only the first or only place that they knew is their home. Um, and and again, that sort of harks back to the idea of adaptability. But yeah, you know, the, the cricket test, which was obviously the Norman Tebbit cricket test that they always used to talk about. My mum supports um, England when she watches cricket. You know, she doesn't... And again, that is also partly because she wouldn't necessarily support India, but she's never lived in India. So... So it is really complicated and, and, you know, I don't think we can delineate. And I think there's often this, this need, particularly when talking about race or class and things like that, where you're, you're trying to put people into sort of pigeonholes. And actually what I try to do in my writing is show that it's, we're just people and that we, we, have some, we have very different fabrics to who we are, um, dependent on lots of different things, um, dependent on our personalities, but also where we've been brought up where our family was brought up um, and how closely affiliated we feel to the people around us. And I guess one of the contrasts for me in that is that Jaya sees her home in family. So wherever the family is and wherever they're together, that's home. So she can adapt to wherever that might yeah. be. I get the feeling with Asha that 
there's a potential in there for her to feel home as a place um, and not necessarily feel like it has to be just a family thing. You feel that there's a sense of liberation or there's a sense of change or her um, her needs and her wants and and her and scales falling from her eyes. You feel that kind of personal journey about to take off. Yeah, um, that's right. And so it kind of feels like there's another book in there, <laughs> that the next part of this. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, I think the whole concept, I think you're absolutely right about Asher and, and what, what home is to her is slightly more abstract, I suppose, or intangible. Um, I agree with that. And yeah, and I absolutely agree also with this idea of Britain for these sorts of Asian women, both Jaya and Asha of different generations, opens up new things for them that they wouldn't have been able to do in in Uganda or India. Um, and so there's that. But um, in terms of sort of following Asha's story further, I'm quite happy to leave her at the end of the book where she is and... I'm not. I don't think I'll ever write sequels to any books because once I've written, right, once I wrote this, I, I was kind of done with those characters. They're still living somewhere away from me, but um, but I kind of just feel that that was the story and that's what I wanted to explore. But you could absolutely, someone else might decide they want to go and write Asher's story because yeah, absolutely, there are people that came here in the seventies, women who came here in the seventies and eighties who have very different lives to the ones that they started out with um, and wouldn't have been possible without coming here. So, yeah, I think it's a really good point. Um, one of the themes in the book, Numa, I, I did feel slightly annoyed throughout most of the book because I had to keep stopping every two minutes to find out what this new dish was. <laughs> there was always the mention of food was just everywhere in this book and they're all terms that I didn't know um, and had to keep looking up and going oh how do you cook that all how does that work so I ended up going on this tangent all the time into some kind of <laughs> recipe site um, so can you talk to us about that theme of food which is so Asian isn't it like it that? is and but also I know when I read books um, I, it really annoys me when people just write things like and then they ate dinner <laughs> know what they ate for dinner or what they drank I, I just I'm so curious I, I mean I, I guess it's the anthropologist in me I think you can learn so much about food about characters um through food and and drink and what they cook what they eat what they don't eat um so for me that was always going to be an important part from that point of view as a reader but as a, as a writer for this sort of novel again it I wanted to explore this idea of absorbing different cultures into the food. So um, although my family's food and obviously the food in the family in the book um, is primarily sort of Gujarati food, which is obviously authentic to Gujarat in India, um, there are certain dishes that we eat as East African Asians. So, for example, um, what we call mogo, um, which is cassava, and we eat that in various forms. We have it fried, a bit like chips, with like lemon and chilli. We have it in coconut milk. So you can see the African influences there. Um, so I wanted to explore that. And I also um, wanted to look at when, when those East African Asians came to England, we eat something called baked bean curry, which is basically like a curry, which is made with cumin and, um, I mean, we use asafoetida, but you can use onions and, and all the rest of it, and baked beans. <laughs> and it's actually really tasty. But those are the sorts of things which, you know, as immigrants, you absorb and you, you take into your own culture. Um, so that was why I wanted to look at it. And, and I appreciate there are a lot of recipes, and I want to try and write about those on my blog as well. Um but yeah, I really wanted to make sure that I was bringing those things to life because they're an important part of East African culture. Oh my God. I could, honestly, I was just tempted to be laughing all over what you said. <laughs> bean, bloody baked bean curry. Give me a break. That is just disgusting. Although now, don't Heinz just call it curried beans? Pro probably. Yeah, probably. Uh, to be honest, you can curry just about anything. We also have I know. banana curry, um, <laughs> oh, God help Brussels sprout curry, you know. Well, yeah, so that was one of the things that really stuck in my mind from the book. I was like, 
God, they made me think about Brussels sprouts in a whole new way. Yeah, I don't like and them. Because I because yeah. I read it, read this book around Christmas time. Um, <laughs> I did actually buy some Brussels sprouts for the first time in years because we yeah. don't normally do a turkey. And I'm like, geez. And I did cook them. And right at the last minute, I was going to make them spicy. And then right at the last <laughs> minute, I caved and just went a traditional pancetta route because I couldn't. <laughs> I, I couldn't bring myself to curry a, a Brussels sprout, but your book almost made me do it. It's so funny. I hate Brussels sprouts, but I like them in curry. So probably because you, you hide the flavour of them so much. <laughs> so, yeah. Oh, God. Um, it was nuts. But, yeah, really interesting for me exploring some of that because there were certain things that I thought, oh, that is quite familiar. But, we, you know, I wouldn't know what they were called. Yeah. Um, we don't, you know, I don't refer to them in the same way. Yeah. But um, yeah, really interesting. Um, and also the, the whole point about food and I guess the whole point about why it's such a pivotal part of um, Asian culture is that it's about the shared experience mm. um, and it's about bringing people together and yeah. it's about family. And it's there's something so visceral about sharing food with other people. And there's a level of comfort yeah. that, that food represents in your book because it brings everyone together. And even when they come together, when they find themselves in England and they get together with people that they were once... Um, uh, they once escaped with it's just the idea that they could all come together and, and join in and share food together and then all of a sudden they're thrown back into that sense of familiarity and and comfort and yes and, and the joy that it brings yeah that you know the the memory of food for a start and as you say it's like it's nostalgic but I suppose also if you have very little um food is one way that you can still sort of celebrate in life and almost treat yourself even if it is like the simplest meal um so I suppose there's an element of that and yeah and yeah just generally obviously it's an Indian cultural thing but also in African culture it's quite a big thing you know to, to gather as a family as a large family and eat together so I, I suppose there, it's weaved through all of that and, and also in Britain let's face it so um but more so, I think, in, in the other two two cultures. So, yeah, I definitely wanted to to make sure that I was staying true to that because that is definitely how I was brought up. We got together a lot and ate a lot of food. Yeah, and in our, our <laughs> household, I mean, with so many of us, it was like a revolving door. There was always someone yeah, there exactly. um, cooking and eating and there was always a pot of food. There was never, you know, a time where there's nothing to eat. Yeah. Um, and it meant that all my brothers and sisters would bring their friends home. So no matter what happened, there'd always be someone eating your food. Um, <laughs> but that, again, like you say, when my parents had very little, but that was a way of keeping all the children and everybody together because everyone would come and yeah. eat in our house. Exactly. It was symbolic in that way, I guess. Um, and when it comes to being a debut novelist and thinking, right, I achieved that. This is my, my first attempt at, at writing a book no sooner have you finished it I'm sure you're already thinking or have started researching your next book but is there some somewhere in you because a lot of for a lot of first-time novelists you often hear of them further down the track maybe having you know another few books in them and then somehow that first one gets blown up again and you know everyone goes back to read their first um their first book do you feel like as a writer you've already changed and that mm. there are different things that are going to happen now and that you wouldn't approach this book in quite the same way or, or how do yeah. you feel about it? Yeah, it's a really interesting point. I think so. Um, I, I'm, I think I'm actually in the minority in, in getting my first book published. I think a lot of authors you'll find have more than one book and I'm not saying that I'm therefore better than them. I think it's just happened that way for me and I, I had a story that hadn't been told before and I think that was a large part of it actually because there's lots of very skilled writers out there um but it is about marrying some writing skill with with a story that hasn't been told so I suppose I landed at the right time on that but um yes and I I already reading some parts of the book I think oh I wish I'd done this or I'd done that um but I don't regret it and I think it was always going to be my first book and I think sometimes a, a debut author's book often has a lot of autobiographical elements 
Mine perhaps slightly less so in that, yes, this is my family background, but it's not, not necessarily my background. I mean, I was born here. I haven't known any other country as a home apart from a brief period living in the US. So, um, so it was still slightly removed. Um, but yeah, I, I think I would do things differently. And I read, but I feel like I'm not the, the only one because I read an interview with Sarah Waters and she said she can't read Tipping the Velvet anymore because she just cringes at every line and so that made me feel better because if, if Sarah Waters feels like that then I can't be that bad and that's obviously very normal. It's interesting it's you know it's hard enough when you um, you know used to write essays at school or <laughs> yeah. you know write a letter or an email um, and you really labour over it but to have a novel and then go back and think oh I could have done this or I could have done that How, what what was your process in order to just be able to put it down and leave it oh I think you get to, <laughs> I don't know if I should admit this but you get to a point where you've done so many drafts um and and you think and, and also uh, more professionally I should say uh you get to the point you've done so many drafts and you can't really see any further way of improving it yourself at which point you then might try and seek out an agent who might then give more feedback and then you hopefully get an editor and they'll give more feedback. So it's still evolving all through those processes. Um, but the problem is I, I never write the end on any, on any of my stories because I don't think there ever is an end to my stories because I could always be polishing and changing. You know, if you have a long enough period away from a story or a book, you probably will find things that you want to change, you know, throughout your life, you'll want to change them because you as a writer change, but you as a person change. So I think you just have to accept that there comes a point where you feel like you've done as much as you can, or you've got so sick of, the, of hearing about these and reading about these characters that you've really done as much as you can. I mean, most authors will have written 20 to 30 drafts, if not more, of their book by the time it's published. So... Um, you know, if you read a book once or twice, that's good going. But if, you, if you've had to read that same book 30 times, you really have to be invested in that in that story to do that and keep changing it and adapting it. So, yeah, I think I think it's always going to be the case. I'll know when I'm done with a, with the story because I'll just be sick of it. That'll be my way of knowing. <laughs> and so just to reiterate, you know, for people who don't know you know Nima does have a day job um, yeah yeah and quite a big stressful one and so <laughs> to have achieved writing a novel getting sick of it reading and you know rewriting it 30 times well you know fair fair dues I think you'll know oh, when thanks. you've um you've been done with it yeah I think it's easier when it's a passion and also um that is the norm for a lot of writers I don't think people realize that most writers have day jobs certainly when they start out um and it's just something you do if you really want to write. I think you'll just have to find the time to do it. Um, and I don't have as many other commitments as some writers do, so it's a bit easier. Um, but yeah, I don't want to make out I'm special in that regard because a lot of people do do have that same scenario. You know, thinking about um, everyday realities from, you know, pursuing dual careers um to to living with challenges you know one of the things I really loved was the way you treated Vijay's disability in the book his disability was incidental to everything else that was going on and incidental to him as a person yeah um and it only really mattered to anyone that met him for the first time it kind of didn't matter. It was never referenced. It was never a thing. It was never important to anyone other than to strangers. Um, and I thought that was really cleverly done. And, and there was something quite refreshing about that. It wasn't the thing that defined him. And even in a new place, it didn't need to be the thing that defined him. People tried yeah. Um, yeah. and in some cases made him feel inadequate. But he had a lot more going for him that yes. meant he came through that. And so can you talk to us a bit about what your thought process was about having a so-called character with a disability? Mm. Yeah, um, I mean, I've got I've got family members who have disabilities, not the specific disability, but they have other physical uh, disabilities. And my grandma actually was in a wheelchair for, with arthritis for, for the last years of her life. And again you know that was just one thing about her but it wasn't the main thing that any of us thought about or 
or she thought about. And so from that point of view, I thought it was was really important not to be defined by it. I was inspired by a lot of different things. I mean, yes, real people. Um, strangely enough, partly Game of Thrones, dare I say it, because they've got people like, you know, Tyrion Lannister, who, who again, you know, they are... They aren't necessarily uh, what you might expect as a hero, um, but they are multifaceted characters in their own right, and that's that was really important. And it's so interesting what you say about strangers defining him, and I suppose that is another theme of the book, which is it, it, whether it's about being a citizen or you know what you're able to do or not able to do or who you are, it's life seems to be a lot of other people imposing their view of who you should be and to, in the same way as with the women and what they should be able to do or not do. Um, so perhaps slightly subconsciously, that was another thing that was sort of running through it in the, in terms of that's not how he sees himself. It's not how most people would see themselves in that situation. So why would you portray it in that way? Um, but I tried to do a lot of research to to, to make that feel hopefully authentic yeah definitely I thought it was a really um it was a really interesting way of 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 approaching that and also it's the same as how um strangely effortless the racism is in the book as well you know it's it is entirely as racism feels it's always someone else imposing that on you and not necessarily how you feel um when it's directed um towards you and and there's something that's in you that on one hand that it it um swells anger in mm. your guts you know um to to a certain point but it also makes you laugh uncontrollably yeah. because it's so far removed from how you necessarily see yourself um yeah. so it's just it's I I thought that the whole when we're dealing with such massive topics at the moment you know like um the gender roles um race Mm. um inequalities injustices disabilities they're huge topics that everyone has an opinion on and wades in and thinks that they know how to talk about and actually when you're on the receiving end of those things they're very subtle and um you know that they they impact you in very different ways and I thought that the book dealt with those really really well because they were just um another part of what happens to you yeah I think so I I tried not to be I mean sometimes yeah things like the racism is overt but I tried not to be heavy-handed with it um because that's another experience of whether it's sexism or racism or uh, ableism or you know classism sometimes it's indirect you almost don't sometimes even realize you're your people are needling at you until later um and so sometimes I wanted to sort of show that as well it's not just you know again cartoon character um sort of racist who is very overt and says really nasty words to you to your face it can be other things um and it's also not just one race who are racist you know and that's another thing I wanted to show um there are prejudices on all sides um but as you talked about earlier also kindnesses on all sides yeah and also the the kind of injustices the prejudices and the kindnesses within cultures as well which yes. is always quite funny um to observe and see yeah um i mean my mum is the most judgmental person on the planet which you know obviously is a good catholic uh, ethnic character that's what they all um you know <laughs> strive to be clearly um but um she it's really interesting to see how you're always governed by these things you know they're always around you everyone's always ready to judge wherever you are yeah and I thought the book in the book that's explored in a really interesting way because as you say whether you're being judged by um you other Ugandan Indians or whether you're being judged by Idi Amin and his followers or by the British people who you meet in the job centre or wherever. It's it's kind of all around you and it's part of life that you have to get used to when you are always in a minority position. It's something that you have to get used to when you are not ever part of a host community. And yes. 
Yeah. And that's just part of life, I think. Yeah, and I suppose as they grew up as um, Ugandan Asians for Vijay and Asha and Pran, and actually the, the, the parents, they were already used to, to that. Like they, they might have felt Ugandan Asian, but they also were not perceived to be by certain people. Um, but, but I think you're absolutely right about the whole you know, tribalism in the wider sense. So whether that's uh, prejudice against caste, and in fact, the Ugandan Asians, and I, I certainly know certain East African Asians who almost look down at Indians from the subcontinent because there's this sense of East African Asians having made good and therefore being somehow superior. Um, to the Indians, which isn't the case. But it's as you say. And then the same with Idi Amin. As well as the 80,000 Ugandan Asians that were expelled, you know, it's estimated 300 million to half a billion um, Ugandan Asians. The the, the estimates really vary. Um, Ugandan, sorry, um, were murdered uh, by Idi Amin. You know, a lot of people disappeared during his reign. And, you know, he reigned for a long time at nine nine years I think it was so so there's that as well and he you know he went after whole entire tribes as I talk about in the book and just picking up lastly on that um your interest in in exploring the historic element of um experiences um of British Asian experiences in the, in this book is that going to be a theme is this going to be are you the new kind of you know uh, British Asian Hillary Mantle what, what, what can we be led what can be led to to expect yeah I mean I'll expect British Asian Hillary Mantle on all my books because it clearly I'm at that her level but um I I think I, I mean I'd like to write British Asian history um I have got some ideas for contemporary stuff but at the moment I like I said I feel like there's so much ground to be covered still in our past because no one has written it there are obviously you know I grew up with books from the subcontinent so Salman Rushdie and um, Arundhati Roy um, I grew up with certain books about Indian immigrants to the UK like Brick Lane um, and to an extent Zadie Smith White Smith uh, White Teeth sorry but but there aren't many about um, there aren't many set in the past and there aren't that many set about East African Asians who've come over here so I might explore that further in future books um but I just feel that there's a lot of stories that haven't been told from our history and that should be told so yeah I I guess you can pigeonhole pigeonhole me as that for the time being I don't mind and have you had any sense of um how this book might be received um in Uganda um I've had I think I've had a couple of people online talk about it. Um, not masses just yet, um, because it's not out, obviously. But I hope that I've been true to the experiences um, of Ugandan Asians, but also um, ordinary ethnic Ugandans. Um, and I did speak to certain people when I went on to on research trip to uh, Uganda and spent some time in Kampala in particular. Um, but But equally... There were certainly amongst Ugandan Asians, there was a hesitancy to talk about what happened. A lot of people wanted to leave it in the past, felt it was too painful. Um, I was very lucky to come across some archive resources um, by SOAS, um, uh, part of the University of London, and they'd done hours and hours of video interviews with um, former Ugandan Asian exiles. So that was really helpful because there were people that were willing to talk about it and it gave me quite a lot of different stories that I could then piece together as one. Um, but And I, I haven't really spoken to many Ugandan Asians about the book, but certainly my parents have read it and they felt it was authentic to East Africa and it's just a case now of hopefully seeing if I've got it right on the wider story of Ugandan Asians. Oh, well, thanks very much to Nima Shah for joining us today on this Book and Easter podcast. It's been great talking to you about your debut novel, Kololo Hill, which, as I said, has been published by Picador and your launch will be on the 17th of February. So best of luck with that. And to finish off, um, Nima's going to read us um, a couple of extracts from her book, Kololo Hill. 
Thank you. Yeah, so this first um, scene is taken from the very beginning of the book. Um, so I will start and it's from Asher's point of view. They'd be back before curfew. Asher was sure of it. She got out of the car and looked far across the water to where the Nile flowed into Lake Victoria. In the late afternoon light, the mosquitoes glowed gold, like embers from a fire. Be quick, won't you? Jaya called from the car window, pulling her sari chundri tighter over her silver hair. And be careful. Hush, Jaya, she's not a child, said Mottichand. Besides, we can see her from here. The car swayed like a rowing boat as Asha's father-in-law hoisted himself into the back seat and lay down for a nap. Asha slipped off her two jumper, blades of grass tickling her toes, the dragonflies dancing at her feet. She shook her hair free from her ponytail, aware that Jaya was probably looking on, loose hair for loose women. Jaya had wanted to go straight home, anxious to reach Kampala before the soldiers began their night patrols but Asher had managed to persuade them to stop off on the way. What harm would it do to get a little fresh air after being cooped up in the car, to steal a few moments in the place she'd visited so many times as a child with her parents? There were more people here in the old days, of course, the sweet smoky scent of roasting mogul carrying across the breeze. Tinny transistor radios buzzing in the distance. Now all Asher could see was a few fishing boats, and the crotchety marabou stalks, with their black feather cloaks, gathered in the shallows. She walked towards the vast water, stretching so far that it looked like an ocean. She'd met Pran for the first time by Lake Victoria, down by Entebbe. She bristled as she thought of him now. She was sure that Pran was keeping something from her. He dodged her questions before she'd left for Ginger that morning. Asha wandered further along. It was too beautiful a day to waste it thinking about him. Something was jutting out at the water's edge, a strange mass that seemed to grow from the banks, blackened in parts, ashen in others. Asha stepped closer. This wasn't the root of a plant, but sinewy muscle, twisting tendon. Upstream, there were more. Hacked bodies bobbing in the billowing lake. A crackle of fear. Asha turned fast, hurrying back towards the others. Slow your pace, she told herself. Don't alarm them. What happened? Why are you hurrying? Jaya got out of the car. Mottichan sat up, voice full of sleep. What's going on? It's been a long day. Asha glanced back, trying to sound calm. Shall we go? I thought you wanted to spend some time here. I did. I'm just a little tired. Asha hovered by the back seat. Why wouldn't Mottichan hurry up and put his shoes on? She looked towards the road. No sign of soldiers, thank God. She told herself that the rumours must have been embellished growing as neighbour told friend told colleague. How could she have been so wrong? The broken limbs flashed through her mind as she climbed into the car. Idi Amin didn't care that those poor people's bodies were bobbing in the water, out on show for all to see, killing anyone who spoke out against him or threatened his powers. He might not stop until the whole river ran red. So that's the first uh, reading. So this is a second reading from a little bit further in the book and Asha and her mother-in-law go to visit a family friend. For decades, the Europeans had lived at the top of Kololo Hill, looking down on the city from their villas and mansions, the scent of jasmine and frangipani wafting in between the houses hidden by mango trees and rose bushes, papaya and hibiscus. After independence, most of them went home, back to the colder climes of Britain, Ireland, Germany and France. The wealthiest Asians had swiftly moved in to take their place. Jaya's friend, Mrs Goswami, lived in one such home, a house with a pink tiled roof and white walls flanked by proud pillars. Asha decided to join Jaya on one of her afternoon visits, anything to fill the long day that stretched before them. During the drive further up Kololo Hill to Mrs Goswami's house, Asha watched the narrower streets and compact single-storey homes give way to broader roads and vast gated two-floor houses that looked out across the city centre below. Your place on the hill was directly connected to your wealth, with the richest at the very top. Below them all, the poorest Asians lived in cramped old apartment blocks and crumbling houses, 
and at the foot of the hill were the cement blocks and corrugated iron roofs where many of the black Ugandans lived. Once inside, they were led to a vast reception room filled with statues carved out of soapstone and wood. Asher would much rather have been outside amongst the bright pink flowers of the bougainvillea and the fluttering monochrome butterflies, but instead here she was getting a headache from the gaudy knickknacks in every corner. Come in, message owl! With each sentence, Mrs Goswami's voice got louder, the vowels more elongated, as though she was in pain. Awajawa, she said, gesturing to sit next to her, but Asha swiftly took a place next to a baby elephant, carved, although a real one wouldn't have surprised her. She nearly slipped off the seat as her bottom hit the plastic protector that Mrs Goswami had wrapped around all the furniture. Jaya sat opposite, feet dangling from a huge velvet armchair. Grace called out their host. Where is that girl? Mrs Goswami eased herself onto the seat with her walking stick. Her hair was slick with coconut oil and pulled back so tight into a huge low bun that her hairline had started to recede. That morning, Mottigen had joked that he could see his reflection on Mrs Goswami's hair, his face shining back at him in the curve of that black mirror. Finally, she said, watching the house girl, who hummed as she went. A slender girl with almond eyes, she set a tray of food on a table. Biscuits for the guests and a small banana for you, madam. I know you need to watch your weight, Grace said. Yes, yes, mumbled Mrs Goswami, a look of embarrassment on her face. And the chai, Grace? She gave Grace a thwack on the ankle with her walking stick, interrupting the house girl's flow for a moment before she hummed louder. Asha caught Grace, rolling her eyes. She gave the house girl a conspiratorial smile. Mrs Goswami turned back to her guests. Gemcho, everyone well? They exchanged pleasantries while Grace left and returned, humming the entire time. Mrs Goswami must have caught Asha looking at her house girl as she finished serving the tea. I know, I know, that humming is so annoying, Mrs Goswami waved her hand dismissively. I tried to hit it out of her a couple of times, didn't I, Jaya, then? Give her a tata, tapat or two. Jaya's gaze remained fixed on her cooling chai. Mrs Goswami continued. But she doesn't clean as well when I tell her to be quiet. If I want floors that glitter like Lake Victoria, I have to let her make that racket, nay? Even if she sounds like a drowning hornet. Mrs Goswami thrust a stainless tray sorry, stainless steel tray under Jaya's nose, the ginger biscuits slipping and sliding across it. Don't be shy now. Eat, eat. The biscuits were overbaked and had caught at the edges. But Jaya took one anyway. So aggressive was Mrs Goswami's insistence that she take one. When Asha refused a third time, Jaya gave her a look. And how is married life, Meta? Mrs Goswami peered at Asha through thick glasses. Good, Asha said, for what else could she say? Different, I suppose. I worked in an office for a while back in Ginger, so I'm trying to get used to the new routine here. Ah, leave the work to the men, otherwise what's the point? Why do you girls want to be like them? But it's nice to be able to do things on your own, Asha shifted in her seat. Earn money. Bad bread, did someone put ghee in your ears or what? That's why you put up with a husband, to provide for you, ne? Asha stared back. What did Mrs Goswami know? She was a widow with four sons who kept her in the lavish lifestyle she was used to. She didn't know what it was like to have a husband who couldn't be trusted. And that's the end of that sequence. And then there's one there's one more, which is a short um, sequence once um, uh, Jay is in England. And um, it's just a short passage uh, told from her point of view. Jaya walked past Arna's Grove underground station, taking in the circular facade, the strange flat roof. Why anyone would build something that looked like one of the spaceships from Vijay's childhood comic books was beyond her. Though she'd passed by it for weeks since they'd moved out of barracks, she still couldn't get used to it. At the bus stop, a man with long hair waited, his neck covered in flowery writing, a tattoo, though it looked as if someone had decided to write their shopping list on him instead of finding a piece of paper. Jaya waited to cross the street, the hem of her sari gathered at the top of her lace-up shoes. 
The glowing green man told her to walk across the road, but as usual she panicked as the symbol started to flush, skip jogging the rest of the way to make it across before the red man appeared. Inside the shop she wandered around looking at the tomatoes, giving them a sly squeeze for ripeness when Mr Johnson the grocer wasn't looking. The handwritten prices on the signs above the fruit and vegetables were just about decipherable. Some of the corners and lines of English numbers were similar enough to the loops and slants of Gujarati, and she'd been taught the rest by Asha and Vijay. But like a tourist, she found herself converting the money back to Ugandan shillings. Jaya picked up the other goods she needed, having memorised the cobalt blue and bright orange of the washing powder, the familiar teal of the tins of beans, the red, yellow and green cockerel on Vijay's breakfast cereal. She had to look around and above and below the letters to understand this new world, looking at the pictures, colours and shapes as though she was a child again. And that's the uh, final scene. Thank you. That's been Nima Shah reading for us from her debut novel, Kololo Hill, out on the 18th of February, so check it out. And this has been a Bookinista podcast with me, Catherine Nathan, and I hope to see you again. You've been listening to a Bookinista podcast. For the latest book reviews, features and author interviews, head to bookinista.com. <laughs>